Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Hoogst uh, Edward Hoogstra is a senior health advisor at the United Nations Children's Fund, also known as UNICEF. Uh, Dr. Hoogstra, Hoogstra is responsible for a program which in the past six years has resulted in a 78% reduction in de deaths due to measles, the single most successful public health initiative in recent memory. Uh, Dr. Hoogstra worked for the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. In that position, he worked for President Bill Clinton's initiative to increase vaccine coverage among two-year-olds in the United States. Uh, he specifically focused on serving the, uh, the underserved inner city children. Uh, he will speak today on a auto-disabled syringes in a developing world, a techni technical solution addressing a behavioral problem. Uh, I should add that uh, uh, Dr. Hoekstra is accompanied today by uh, Stephen Burns, who is the principal engineer from Beckton Dickinson's company, uh, the makers of the syringes uh, of which Dr. Hoekstra will speak. Uh, please welcome Dr. Hoekstra. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I think we'll go through the next few minutes uh, a little bit through the whole program that we've had. And uh, I expect uh, that you'll have some questions at the end. Um, we also have some uh, little souvenirs. I don't know if they, you can take them home, actually. But uh, we have some devices with us, some uh, syringes. And it's, uh, it's a one-time use only, so sorry. But uh, that's what this whole program is about. So um, We all know that uh, HIV is, a, is transmitted by unprotected sex. But uh, maybe you did not know that every year, about 260,000, a quarter of a million people in the world, go home, come home from the provider, had an injection, and actually um, contracted HIV. A quarter of a million people. Um, this represents about 2.5% of all the HIV injection, new HIV injections per year. And if you go to South Asia, uh, to Bangkok, or any of those places for your holiday, it's actually, you have a chance of the, the, the amount of uh, HIV given is up to 9% of the new cases of HIV. And that's just getting an injection for anything. Could be even a vaccination in the past. Uh, the main reason why people are having these uh, uh, contaminations is that in these countries, in especially Africa and Asia, half of the injection needles that are given, or half of the injections, but the needle has been in the child or the person before you came into the room. So that is a statistic that still counts. So that was not acceptable, and all these cases could be prevented if healthcare workers would just use a clean, new, sterile injection. There's absolutely a mania of injections around the world. 16, it's estimated about 16 billion injections are given around the world. Nearly all of them, 90%, more than 90%, in the curative sector. And a between 5 and 9 percent from immunizations. Only 1 percent is blood transfusion. And with blood transfusion, people are afraid that they might contract some HIV. But in reality, it's actually in the curative sector, you probably would walk, walk away with HIV from an injection. So, Syringes, the use of syringes is a, is a societal problem. Um, doctors like to give a, a needle and a syringe uh, as part of their ther therapy. 
we all know that if you have a tablet, if you are ill, let's start with that. If you are ill, you have some guilt. You say, how could I be ill? I had my coat on every day. How, I didn't do anything wrong. How could I have cancer? I, I had a good life. I didn't do anything. I ate good, I sported, and now I am sick. So we see disease connected with guilt. So if we have guilt, we want to kind of be punished to get better. Everybody will say, ooh, this medicine was so bitter, it must work. And this whole idea that you have to be punished increases if you give an injection. So many medical activities could actually be given with a, just a normal pill. But the, the physician decides to use an injection instead of the pill. Same, same outcome. You would have the same medical outcome with both delivery forms. So there's a lot of injections that could be prevented by using pill, and there are a lot of health uh, treatments that are totally unnecessary. Doctors give, if you have a flu, many doctors over the world will give you antibiotics. It has not, no relationship with the virus. If you can give as many antibiotics as you want, of course it would prevent any uh, any d additional disease, but it would not work on your flu. But people do get these, uh, these uh, antibiotics, and usually, again, in injection form. So we see that 70%, it is estimated, of the injections given around the South Asia have or no use or could easily be given in a pill form. And five, like I said, 50% of all the injections needles have been in somebody else before they entered your skin. So if we look at the, I'm just taking the HIV example, of course, does anyone know which other disease is much more prevalent and which is more, more likely that you would contract? Yeah, hepatitis B, and actually all hepatitis uh, injections, uh, diseases, but hepatitis C. When we started with the hepatitis B uh, vaccination program on, at a grand scale back in uh, 2000, I spoke with the, the manager who was uh, running that program. I said, how could you give that without giving an injection? You need three shots over a period of time to be protected against hepatitis B. If you give it with injection needles that are contaminated, then probably the people have already got the hepatitis B before they are protected. So they actually did change their program after a year and included safe injection materials. Um, reuse of equipment is the most, uh, most uh, chance of getting it. Um, then you have unsafe collection. We have the, the needle stick injuries for the healthcare workers. Um, has anyone given an ejection ever here? Anyone? Okay. Um, there's only one who's given an ejection. <laughs> Brave person there. Did you ever uh, find the needle had to pull it out of your own finger after? Never? Okay, well. You are less, less clumsy than I was because I had it all the time. And uh, um, lucky, most of the times I actually put it in my finger before it, putting it in the patient, so I could only get some of the therapy already. But uh, was more more problematic if I was in an operation room and we got or a sca scapel or something else um, that would touch us or one of the instruments would penetrate us or an injection if the patient, if you already knew that they had HIV or hepatitis B. Um, so it's the unsafe collection. They put it together. Uh, needle stick injuries happened by doing that, but also the unsafe disposal, which means in most countries they just throw the needles and syringes outside the door of the health department. And you'll find them all over there, and kids are playing and collecting them and are at risk. So why are people doing this? I mean, why in the hell is peop are people 
how do they consider putting all these people to risk, at risk? And I think the main reason why people are put at risk is that we have syringes and we have or antibiotics or we have vaccines and I'll just call them antibiotics, some medical treatment, so treatment things and prevention things, uh, activities. And what we have is a disconnect. The supplies, one comes by ship, the other one comes by plane usually in the country because it's small quantities against larger quantities. And in the bush bush where we work, there, one week there's, there are syringes and in two weeks there are no syringes. And now, now you are suddenly the doctor and you have to decide and somebody's dying from a pneumonia, do you give this syringe, do you give this injection, yes or no? And then the benefit could be that if you do give them this syringe, he might survive, but there is a risk, the, the used syringe, yeah? because that's the only one you have. Or do you use a clean one and, uh, and say, well, I can only use a clean one. I'll wait until my supplies come. And most healthcare workers will, will decide to take the risk and give the person an injection. There's also a financial difference. If a, if a doctor here in the US earns about $300 per day, is that a fair number? $500, okay, we're getting closer. No, <laughs> wrong college, if you have medical students, you will get other numbers. Okay, let's say $500 a day. No doctor is going to take any court case or anything for 25 cents, which is a syringe. The cost of a syringe is about 25 cents in the US between 25 and 50 cents. He's not going to take that risk. Now we go to the developing countries. One syringe is 5 cents cheaper. We buy them cheaper. The manufacturers deliver them cheaper to us, and we buy for 5 cents. But the salary of the doctor is about $2 per day. Now you can calculate that if you would find 20 people about that, if I could just use this injection on these 20 people, I could actually double my salary. So the doctor who was making just 500 in the US would suddenly make $1,000. Now that sounds interesting, much more interesting. And you'll be surprised how many healthcare workers then decide that, well, the two of you are married. Not that that's true, but, and I'm not, pointing, but you look married, and you're doing all things with each other, so giving you both the same injection needle doesn't really increase your risk, because whatever you're doing, you're kissing and all that stuff, you must be, and you have the same toilet, you must have this risk already there. So in the thought of a doctor, they would already say, or of the nurse, or whoever is giving the injection, that's an acceptable risk, and it already brings my, in the US it would be, let's say, $40 that you give for every, if we pay $40 for a syringe, I make an extra $40, and, and they don't really take a bigger risk. And other doctors and nurses say, oh, this whole village, you're all students, God only knows what you're all doing. Um, I don't increase your risk, actually, because the risk is already there. So now, suddenly, I've increased my salary with maybe 200%, yeah? So that's an economical factor that is real out there, and people find arguments why it's okay, but of course, we all know it's not okay. So I'll go a bit through how syringes were developed. I have some photos from BD, um, and BD was one of the first, uh, if not the first, uh, uh, company who made syringes in the US. And back in 19, 1897, over 100 years ago, they developed a glass syringe. And the glass syringe has a kind of metal top and a locking device. Has anyone seen a glass syringe ever? 
you have the needle, yes, you have a needle and you have to kind of lock it onto the syringe. And then you unlock it and you have a good chance that you have a needle stick injury with it. And I'm already a bit older. We used to do that in the clinic in Europe. You unlock it and then have it clean. And then you have to um, reuse it after autoclaving. But of course, that has to be, if you do it sterilization, it's 20 minutes. How many people actually wait 20 minutes, especially if patients are waiting outside? So there's all risks in using that system. So doctors hated it, a lot of needle stick injuries, and um, not that safe, really. Although if you did everything according to the firm, it was very safe. But in reality, as soon as you got out of the main hospital, it was not so safe. So we were very, very happy as a community in 1950 to have a disposable, the ones that you know now, a syringe that you can open and leave. And I'll just show you a bit how it works. You are all technical. So the plunger rod, you start with the, the injection. Maybe I can take a syringe here. I'll just... Now this is not the normal syringe, but... So you have a syringe. The first thing is we have a problem with the cap. If I, we, I just spoke with John, and he confirmed that if he was in a bit, not in business class, but flying in the back of the plane, and he took a glass of wine, which he never does, by the way, he denied immediately. But if he took a glass bottle of wine and paid for that, then at the end he, of that process, he would recap his bottle of wine. But it was empty, and the stewardess was going to throw it away anyway. And I bet that everybody here, after drinking a Coca-Cola bottle, just a Coke, will recap that bottle and even would recap. I'm just stealing something from our BD colleague. Look at his, his water, and he's recapped it. Yeah? But this one is full. But if it's empty, it will also be recapped. And then we throw it away. So can you imagine how difficult it is to get nurses to recap a syringe, or not to recap, because we say, oh, this is dangerous. So what we've done is actually um, have now boxes, which you all have in your department, for the safety boxes where you can actually get rid of the syringe in one go. So that's not what we're going to talk about, by the way. Um, in the beginning, the plunger is at the bottom. I hope you can see it there, yeah? And then the clinician just removed the shield, which I do, and I throw it away. That's the first step. Now the clinician aspirates for vaccines, and this is, not, this is actually a different type of needle, so I can't do everything with it. But he pulls this thing up, basically. The next thing is that he will advance it a bit. Anybody who's done this, uh, you'd push it a bit and get all the air out. And then after that, you go to the patient and you put it in his arm. And I don't know if Alex is willing to come here. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I never get volunteers for here. And if they do come here, I'm really concerned. But so. It goes into the arm of the child. Of the, uh, and we work with children with UNICEF, but it goes into the child. So the doctor will pull back a little bit to see if he's in a vein, because you don't want to put the vaccine immediately in the vein. And you, you don't know exactly where all the veins are. You're medically trained, but the vein can pop up in places that you don't expect. So uh, normal practice is you pull back a bit. If it, come, uh, it becomes red here, it means that you're in a vein. And then you stop and you do it somewhere else. But if it's not, if it's clear, you can just pull and nothing comes into the syringe. You actually give the vaccine or whatever you're giving. At that time, now we've got, we have a syringe and we can just go to the next patient. 
who's waiting in line and do the same with that same syringe. That was the syringe we had in 1950. That was OK, but then we had this behavioral problem that doctors were using and nurses were reusing this. So there was a need for a technical solution of this behavioral problem. And the World Health Organization in the 80s asked Beckerson and Dixon, actually, that was the, the firm that was selected at that time, to actually develop a system, just like you're developing new techniques, uh, they were asked to develop a system to have a disposable syringe, one that you could throw away, that you didn't have to re-sterilize and everything, but that it would be modified to make it inactive. And there's two ways to make it inactive. You press it in, like I just did with this one, and it blocks. It can't, this can't get out. We could ask Alex to pull, but if he pulls, you'll see he'll, he's strong, so he pulls, and then the whole thing comes off. So there's two breaks in it. It blocks, and then if you are aggressive or you still want to reuse this thing, you pull, and then it, the whole thing comes off. So you might as well throw it away. And that's the whole idea, that the healthcare worker finds another way of making some extra money. And that could be, or that he waits till the stockpile is filled and only gives the medication uh, or the vaccination at the time that it's needed. Here you see the, uh, an example. The whole secret of this whole, uh, the way they found a solution, and I think that Stephen will give you a bit more information in a minute about it, is that there is this clip in, in the syringe, which is not so easy to get there, but if it's there, it first of all ensures that there's only 0.5 milliliter withdrawn from, we get a, uh, vaccine comes in a powder, so we have to reconstitute it with some uh, aqua and, and or diligent, and then we have 20 doses, or vials usually, a vial with 20 doses. So it, when we pull it out of that vial for one kid, then we use 0.5. So if we have a 10 dose file where, they, where we have to mix 10 dose, we'll have, a opo, we'll have a five milliliter syringe for mixing. Does that make sense? Five milliliter for mixing, but that's 10 doses. So the five milliliter goes into this vial, and now we pull only 0.5 milliliter out for each child, for, because I just gave an example for 10 times. So here it happens. Um, again, the plunge, uh, plunger rod is at the bottom at the beginning, and then you pull the clini clinical, uh, clinical person removes again the shield, and this time the clinical uh, clinician aspirates the vaccine by drawing the plunger rod past the dose line, just a little bit behind, and you can see the dose line. I don't know, see, do you see it here where my arrow is? There's a little line here. So that's the 0.5. So it, there's a little bit left so that he can push a little bit back, a little bit of the air that might have come in while he was drawing the vaccine. Then he, um, at this moment, the clip is actually locked between the plunger head and the first step uh, of, retain, retaining, of the retaining feature. And Stephen will talk a bit more about that part. And then if he presses it out now, actually the clip will go with the whole plunger to the end of the, of the machine. And the, um, at the end, it will be impossible for, for you because it will all block when, as soon as the vaccine is given to the child. I have a little film, and I'll show it. And there's some text with it. There's the plunger rod. The clip, you can see in green up there. 
the barrel around the syringe. Here's the, well, they call it a cannula, which is the needle, and then the safety shield. Now we'll go to the next. That's the components. So very simple, only a few components, the whole system. And here you can see they've just de de designed this mini syringe. I'll let you read through it. And here it breaks if you pull, as you saw before. So let me tell you something about UNICEF. UNICEF uh, is m mainly focused on vulnerable kids in the world and also women, but not women as we know women. We only focus on the part of women that produce children. So we would be interested that women are educated because education uh, has a, a positive effect on the health of children. So it's a, it's a, some people think it's a bit weird how we think of women. So we would be very interested in their pregnancy because the better their pregnancy is, the better the chances that the child will be healthy at birth. So we're interested in those things, because some people ask us, why don't you do this for women, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how we are focused. We're actually focused on kids, and only the relationship with women as far as making the kids or having the kids and the first phase. Uh, immunization is one of the parts. We do shelter, we do water and sanitation. Uh, we have programs on uh, uh, protection and on nutrition, and one of the programs is immunization. And we see it as a common good. Everybody has the right, every kid should have the right. You see a picture up there, actually from Afghanistan, where actually, by coincidence, it's also a BD product that is being, being brought around. Most people don't have never heard of BD. Um, actually, if you walk downstairs along your uh, your you have some things here for the lab, I think, some boxes. If you just walk by that uh, storage place, it's a glass kind of cupboard. If you walk by it, you'll see that there are several BD products there. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, a lot of people work with it without even knowing that the factory uh, exists. But th here we are in Afghanistan, and. Here we actually use donkeys to reach those last kids in the, in the most remote areas. Car, uh, there are no roads there to get there for cars. Um, at, in 2002, there were about two and a half, estimated two and a half million kids that uh, died per year, two and a half million, a huge amount, of a few simple uh, vaccines, uh, diseases that could be treated with vaccines or prevented with vaccines. And here you see a number of these vaccines. So UNICEF has taken it as one of their core principles to make sure that every kid has the opportunity to have access to vaccines. And consequently, we are the largest purchaser of vaccines. We we actually buy 44% of all childhood vaccines worldwide. And the others are in the US and Europe, they buy their own. And actually, South America buys their own too. But the rest of the world basically is, uh, is bought by UNICEF for those countries. And we ship about 3 million doses. And half of them are injectable. The other half are all polio. There's a big polio program going on to try to eradicate polio. So one and a half billion 
of these doses are polio vaccine, and that's a droplet, so you don't need injections. So being responsible for half of all the injectable uh, uh, doses in the world, uh, we take uh, injection safety as a major point. Here you see uh, where we get some supplies are just delivered, uh, not always by military planes. <laughs> Usually we have our own UN planes or we just use normal carriers. This is a picture from Haiti. But there's a whole organization to get those vaccines from the manufacturers to all the way to uh, the child. In, we're going back to 91 when the AD syringe was developed by, uh, in this case it was uh, Becker's BD, and in 92 UNICEF started introducing it. At that time the price was 13 cents, but a normal syringe at that time was about two and a half, three cents. So it was a substantial more expensive. And three years later only 25 million do uh, syringes were bought through UNICEF. And five years later, it had increased a bit, but it was only 50 million. And the main reason was that it was way too expensive for countries to go from, uh, from 2 cents to 13 cents. So by 1999, there the were a few agencies that work all for uh, the United Nations. It was the United Nations Population Funds, UNICEF, and the World Health Organization got together and had a joint statement saying that all countries should take action to only use AD syringes, especially in the immunization world. Because if you, again, we spoke about it earlier, if you get an antibiotic because you're dying from pneumonia, then you might want to take that risk that you get in one of the other diseases over a time. At least you get through this period of your life. But if you're getting an immunization, you don't even know if you get an immunization against diphtheria. The chance that you actually get diphtheria is very small, even in developing countries. But if you get it, it's very fatal. So for kids that are not exposed, that are totally healthy in front of you, you have to have a different ethic and say, no risk is acceptable to, to uh, provide uh, vaccines. So we came up with this bundled idea, the bundled vaccines, and you'll see it sometimes mentioned, which means that you basically give a safety box, you give a syringe, and you give the vaccine. Well, the first ones who were 100% against it were all the donors, including the American government, who were paying for lots of the, our activities, and the Canadian government. They said, we're not going to pay for, vac uh, for syringes. Before you know it, we're paying for the toilet paper, and I don't, know, I don't know what else, yeah? So we're not going to pay for it. We'll just purchase vaccines. And lucky enough, the common sense changed, and people realized that in 20 years, we would actually not be awarded a Nobel Prize for all the kids we were saving. We would probably be in The Hague on a trial for... Uh, causing so many kids to have hepatitis B or uh, HIV in 20 years' time, looking backwards. So people realized that that was a risk for their donations, and now it's totally changed. There is no vaccine being transported without the whole package, partly to ensure that the healthcare worker is somewhat protected and that the children are definitely protected. So the introduction of these AD syringes went through what we call the measles program. The measles program is a program that basically started in 2000. In 2000, we found that of the main diseases in the world um, for children under five years, measles was ranked number six. So it was a lot of kids died from measles. And we will say, measles? How could that be? Well, what is measles? It's a, high infectious disease. Everybody in this room, if I'm sitting here, you were not, most of you have had an injection, and the older people around us have had measles when they were young. If I sit in the room with you for here for two hours, we won't sit here for two hours, but if I sat here for two hours, you all would have measles. 
if you were unprotected and I would have measles. So that's how infectious it is. That's why they're always afraid of bioterrorism and etc. because it's so infectious and so the virus is very effective finding the people who are not protected. So it occurs in epidemics. You usually have three years no measles and then everybody seems to get measles and then three years. But everyone eventually gets measles. We have, if you get the measles, you have a lifetime immunity. You won't get anybody who says, I had twice measles. They had two different things. You don't get twice measles. And the vaccine is very effective, but not fully effective. We give it at nine months of age, the dose, in, in the developing countries. But at that time, there are still some antibodies in the, from the mother. And the antibodies from the mother actually protect the child for the first nine months against measles. But some women have more antibodies, so the kid will have more antibodies, and then the kids will be protected till 12 months. So if you give an injection at nine months, the vaccine will just be eaten up by the antibodies. Say it in a simple way. So then three months later, when the kid is one year and one month, and he gets measles, he is totally unprotected, although he had a vaccination. So to catch those, that group of kids that, uh, and you don't know which kid was vaccinated and was not immune, and which kid was vaccinated and is immune, so it's better to give a second shot. And that's why in the US, you have to have a second shot. You could not get into this elite school without showing that you had two doses of measles. Anybody who can show me that that's not true, I would like to document it, but I believe nobody here could get away with getting into this institute without two shots. That's the, that's the thing. Measles kills. And then we say, but we had measles. I had measles myself when I was young. But we, we, ne we never died, or very few, but you never heard about it. Well, measles dies, and it disables also. It gives cornea uh, scars in the eye, so kids can't read anymore. It's a developing country. That means that you, if they have schooling, they get, can't do the schooling, and their opportunities are minimal. So how come that measles is so dangerous in Africa and Asia and not a problem whatsoever is in America? Well, first of all, you've eradicated measles because everybody is vaccinated with two doses. So off, from time to time, you'll see outbreak of measles and all people run there and it's a big do and they have maybe five or six cases of measles. That's the first reason why it's not a problem. But in the past, it was also not such a big problem. And the main reason was that in the industrialized world, it's different than the non-industrialized world. And now I'll give you, tell you why. The measles infection on itself only kills one out of 2,000 kids. One out of 2,000. So that's not a public health problem. If it's your kid, it's 100%, I can tell you. But for the public health, it's not a problem. So how is it then that Africa is such a problem? Well, with measles, you have three weeks following the infection, you have a full immune deficiency, just like you have AIDS, not HIV, you have AIDS, you have full-blown AIDS. It's not AIDS, it's not connecting, but it's like having AIDS. Your immune system is very low. So a common cold or a common diarrhea that you normally would have in this society would in, in the bush bush means with no access to health care means that you can't get your drip for a diarrhea you can't get your antibiotics so that kid suddenly that he gets measles two weeks later with his immune deficiency that only lasts for three weeks he gets some disease and that becomes life-threatening and that's why you see all these kids die on pneumonia and basically diarrhea. So it's the complications kids die from. Now you can say, well, we don't have to do measles campaign because we can just fix that. But 
anybody who has a quick fix to get health care to all the kids in Africa and Asia, I'd love to talk with them. So we knew where the kids were. We had, there were 47 countries. We looked at the statistic, 47 countries. And there was actually 98% of all the mortality of, the, of measles was in those 47 countries. And those 47 countries all had one common thing. They had only one dose of measles. All the other countries had two doses. So this, the kind of what program you should do was kind of clear. You had to introduce two doses. But these were the poorest countries. Now, if you have 40% coverage in your country, you can reach only 40% of the children. If you give them a second dose a year later, or like in the US at six years of age, a while later, you probably will also catch 40% of the kids. So that program, you still have 60% of the kids not vaccinated. As measles is the most effective disease, or infectious disease, then you would not have a good success. So we decided to do a different strategy for the second dose in all these countries. We decided to do a campaign. And what we did is first a campaign, and we vaccinated all kids under 14 years of age. How many percent do you think of, is that of the population in Africa under 14? Not close. It's about between 42 and 48, depending on the country. So that's the 40 was very close, but that's almost half the population. You have to pop. That was quite an undertaking, and everybody said that we were crazy when we started, and we were crazy, but we did do it. So, so we had a strategy of the first dose, what I said, at nine months of age, and we wanted to have six, 90 percent. But the reality is. We had all these 47 countries that were way lower than 90%. So that is a goal, but it's not where we were. And we provided the second dose in the countries with a high coverage, with 90%, like US. You can easily give a second dose also, and then that will take care of the disease. But the other countries all needed a campaign. You have to have good surveillance. You have to check where you have outbreaks, because that shows that the population uh, you didn't do your job well, basically. Somehow this population um, is getting the disease, so that means that you didn't vaccinate them, or a whole camp of people came from another country because they had a problem. But you have to have surveillance to find where the weaknesses are, and then you have to address it. And then the third, the last thing we did as a strategy is we made sure that it was safe. And we introduced AD syringes through the campaign, but then it was going to be used in all the routine activities. We knew how it to do it. We, we had a strategy. We wrote the strategy. We got all the donors to agree with the whole package, not a part of the package. And we published the omelet. And so from 2000 on, 47 countries started vaccinating their kids. And they went to the most remote areas in every country we went. And you can see them. In the bottom, you see uh, uh, this was Cambodia in the middle bottom. They actually went from house to house. They vaccinated. That's a bit overdone. Uh, what you, more, you saw more frequent is what you see here on the, uh, this side. On the, for you, it's, uh, I guess, the left side. On the bottom, you have a tree in a small village. You put down a table or something that looks like a table. A nurse comes. We only used health professionals. Nurse comes, and then a row of people come with kids. And then we had often the Red Cross helping us. And they would go and knock on the doors of the huts and say, bring your kids to this tree. And with that, we would reach up to around 95%, even in places like Afghanistan and in Angola and DRC. So there was a major success. And we also, while we had set up things like Haiti, this is a picture of Haiti, we had finally, we had no measles in Haiti at the time that the earthquake came. 
but then you have to also work in situations like this. So the first thing UNICEF did after the Haiti activity was actually uh, conduct a measles campaign there. And no pain without an audience, as I said earlier. <laughs> but it's worthwhile, we say. Ow, ow. <laughs> and I've never seen a happy kid. Actually, in Africa, we have to get them out of the trees. The, the small ones, they have to just go in line, and they get an injection and yell. Uh, the kids that have legs and can walk on them, they actually, and if they can climb, we have to get them out of trees. Because if you stand in this line, and they're crying over there, uh, you're kind of crazy to stay in that line. And, so, and we can't blame them because we're UNICEF, but we do get them out of the trees and give them a yell. And we have all our friends who help us. Uh, here's Mia Farrow, who is uh, helping us in Haiti and, and getting the attention that we need to get our funders to pay for some of the activities. So success to date, the last few slides. Well, here are the countries that we were talking about. These were these 47 countries. Today, as of today, all countries have done their large campaign up to four, 14 years of age. And then the trick is then every three years later, you have to vaccinate all the kids up to three years of age because the group is older. So you have three years of kids that were not vaccinated or they just get the first nose you want to give the second dose. So every three years, we go back to all these 47 countries, and then we vaccinate all the kids basically between one and three, because that's the uh, one and four, so three birth cohorts. And India, lucky enough, last year finally decided, with long, many times going and talk with the government and, and, uh, and the health departments, um, they have started with campaigns in 14 of the poorest states, and they did a pilot project. And for China, uh, India, the pilot project is always different than for us. Uh, there was about 24 million kids were vaccinated in the two weeks. And, but that's for them a pilot project. And this year, they'll actually vaccinate around over 100 million kids in those areas. And the rest of the country, the, south, the, country, the states in the south, they have uh, in total 35 states. The states in the south are just going to introduce it as a second dose in the routine because they have a higher coverage. So here, here you see what happened in Ghana. I'm just taking Ghana because I heard that some of you had uh, connections with Ghana. And you see in red the number of cases reported. And I have to say that since 2000, the reporting skills have gone up. Because before that, we did passive reporting. After that, we started a bit more with active reporting. So that might have taken two years to get started. So you would actually expect it to go up the number of cases found. But what we see is that after the first campaign, vaccinating everybody up to 14, it, in 2003, it drops off dramatically. By 2004, there are no kids having measles. And in 2006, they did their small campaign, vaccinating only up to four years. And you see that it stayed low. And it's, uh, they just received last week an award from their Minister of Health for three years without any deaths of measles in the country. That was the Ministry of Health who received that. And here you show, I'm just showing two countries. I have it for every country, and I'm sure that you don't really want to see them all. But this is Cameroon, same story in 2001. They did it a bit earlier. They did it over two years, the first campaign, because they didn't have enough vaccine in the first and not enough funding. So we did it over two years, in 2001 and two. And you see a major drop of measles. Meanwhile, that blue line is going up, which is the coverage of the first dose. So we're also working to get that first dose higher and higher, so that eventually, if it's like 85%, we can actually stop with the campaigns and introduce a second dose in the program. Mortality went down with 78% worldwide, 78%. So that's in the last eight years, basically. So. Uh, highly successful program, and 
If you look at the AD syringes, now we go back, this starts in 1997. You could see that in 2000, we made the political decision to start using it every time we did a campaign. And you can see the dramatic increase to almost 1 billion uh, AD syringes used, bought by UNICEF. After that, we see it decline, a decline in, and that does, doesn't mean that AD syringes are not being used anymore, but the larger countries like India and Pakistan decided to buy it themselves again, take the responsibility themselves. They said, it's my kids, I'll buy my own syringes. And the good news is that all the countries are using these auto-disabled syringes that, that can only be used once. Um, that have started through UNICEF. And we hope, of course, that this line in reality goes to zero and that all the countries, just like before 1990, take the responsibility of injection safety, but the standard is much higher. So as of today, 71% of the countries use AD syringes only. You say, oh, that's not such a success then. But if you look which countries are not using it? It's US, Belgium, Mexico. Now, Mexico actually is using it. But it's usually, but the uh, former Soviet Union in general is not using it. So the, all the Tajikistan, the Kazakhstan, Tajikistan actually, again, is using it because it's poor. But all these other countries, middle countries, are not using AD syringes yet. And that's on one side OK, because they are earning more, so they will be using it less. But uh, we can uh, show you many examples, e even here in the US, where now uh, we are, for the first time, have introducing AD syringes, because healthcare providers are not as good as we actually thought they were. And, Although everybody wanted to put their hand in the fire for the healthcare workers in Europe and America, now it seems that we are looking into it. A lot of people are getting HIV and hepatitis B through mechanisms that they didn't think of. Uh, I'll give you a short example. In, uh, I'm living in New York, in uh, Long Island. They had a big process, many people were examined for HIV because in the hospital they had this nice little pin for diabetes and they would just click it into the people. It's a nice mechanism, very nice uh, needle, but it doesn't look like a needle. You just click it, but the needle comes out and gives you a little pinch. But they were using it from patient to patient, and of course it is no different than what's happening in the developing countries. So. Room for improvement also where we are. And this is the last slide. Lack of injection safety is unacceptable. And bundled vaccines have been successful introduced in immunization program among all the poorer countries. And now the big challenge is, what about the curative sector? Because in the curative sector, uh, we haven't been working because we don't actually work. Uh, UNICEF doesn't really work in the curative sector. We, work on prevention, but not on curative. So thank you very much. And I want to thank some people who helped me put these slides together. And maybe you want to say, Stephen might say something on the syringes. Well, I'll give them to you so that you can just play with them. Actually, looking for one myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just easier for me to hold it while I go through it. Yeah. Perfect. Mm. 
No, it's it's something else. Yeah, there's. I'm sure there's enough. Okay, so I'm Stephen Burns again. I'm actually a, a staff engineer. I work for, for Beckton Dickinson. I actually led the product development project that launched this. We launched this uh, last year, and already it's in about 30 different countries in, in, on four continents. So we, we've gotten good distribution uh, already of it. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go briefly through how this thing works. Um, and, and the thing I want to start with is it, this is a very kind of uh, a simple solution to, to a problem and actually can, can do a lot of good in the world with, you know, with, with actually a fairly simple, uh, simple design concept. So like uh, Dr. Hookshire said, so the, the clinician would remove the shield. Um, if you guys go and, and go ahead and just pull back in the plunger rod, um, you can actually feel the plunger rod ratchet over, uh, over all of these steps on the plunger rod. And you can see them, uh, you can see them uh, all along here. Okay, and what these, the purpose of that is, is so that this clip, we call it a reuse prevention clip, uh, the feet of here, these, kind of, these guys here, will actually engage with each of these retaining features. So that the, the clip, um, when the plunger rod is pushed down, will actually advance uh, with the plunger rod. So if you go ahead and actually advance the, uh, the plunger rod, uh, and you can stop it at any point, and when you stop it, you cannot pull back, uh, you can't pull the plunger rod back again. So basically, no matter how you use this, you're only going to get one aspiration and one injection cycle uh, through it. Once you're, once you're finished with the injection, um, then if you actually go ahead and put more force on it, you'll actually break the plunger rod. So it actually, uh, you can't put a huge amount of force on it to try to force that clip back through there. So this clip is actually designed so that it slides actually fairly smoothly down the, the barrel. But when you go to push it back, these spikes engage and prevents the uh, the plunger rod from, from being pulled back. Okay, and, and <laughs> please don't stick yourself with these. <laughs> so I vision, I, yeah, I vision of somebody with like four needles stuck out of their head coming from this. But um, It, um, it, it'll lock, um, but the, the, the initial placement of the clip determines how much um, vaccine you can actually deliver. So you can actually deliver point, uh, point 0.5 ml, no matter how, you, how far you pull back the plunger rod to begin with. So no matter how far you pull the plunger rod back, the clip will advance with the plunger rod. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Hoekstra. Uh, in the United States, there is a minority of people who uh, are opposed for various reasons to vaccinations in general. Uh, and I know that this exists in some other countries as well. Uh, what's the UNICEF's position on that? Well, we think it's... Uh, the, the issue is that, of course, the more intelligent we are and the more successful the program is, the less cases you have, or you might not have any cases. There have been no polio cases in the US for over 20 years. Well, when I was a kid, and I wasn't living in America, but in America you had the same problem. All, all kids were, in the summer, the parents would say, don't go and swim in the, in the pool. Fe uh, polio goes through, if you get polio, you actually it goes through the feces. It's an, unfortunately, but we're all kind of medical. And so if you swim, your colleagues or your kids around you will lose some feces, 
and you will swallow it, and that's how you get polio. That's one of the main courses. Or you have toddlers and with their diapers and playing with each other. They end up with contact with the fetuses. And that's the transmission of polio. So parents would not allow you to go into, uh, into uh, the swimming pool in the summer. So that has a major impact. Now we have no polio, so everybody forgets quickly. But you saw Mia Farrow. Did everybody know Mia Farrow, actress? She, um, she actually, when she was nine, she had uh, polio. And she uh, was in a, one of these lung machines. Have you ever seen these uh, automatic, they keep your lung moving because her lungs were also paralyzed? She was one year in a, in a, a lung machine and then came out. And if you look in the movies where she is half naked, then you can see still that one leg is much thinner than the right other leg, and as a doctor looking, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> um, so history is not so far away. It's just that we don't see it anymore, so people think it's OK. But if you stopped vaccinating here, you'd have it, all these diseases back. That's the problem with. At the moment, you don't see the diseases, and everybody can have a theory. You have also a lot of people saying that this and this happens from this disease. An example is autism. Autism was associated with MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine in the UK. The, the study was flawed. Uh, Lancet got th four reviewers who all said this is nothing. But then Lancet came to the conclusion if it was true, if this trend was true, because they didn't have a control. You all know that you need to have a control, don't you? I mean, if you just prove your point without a control, it's not so strong. And so instead of stopping the article, the magazine said, I'd rather be wrong than be second in publishing it. So they made that decision. On, they got a few new reviewers, and they finally agreed with it. Consequently, uh, coverage in the UK went from 98% to 82%. And kids were, again, in the last few years, every year almost, a kid dies in the UK from measles. And that's with all the health uh, systems that can support these kids. So parents get very confused with all these messages. And now it's been denied and everything. And when I was in the UK last time, they had actually kicked this doctor out of the medical license for the UK. He's meanwhile gone to Canada and has his lab there. So we're not helpful as a society with each other. And then in the Daily Mail, the first thing was uh, conspiracy. Uh, the government kicked this doctor out because they didn't like what he said. Yeah? And that's the main message to the public, which is, again, confusing just when you've thought you had it behind you, but it always comes popping up. So it is uh, true. We have uh, groups that uh, it is very good not to vaccinate your kid, because at that moment, you take zero risk for the vaccination. There's always, a little, there's always kids that get even a painful arm for a day. So you could take zero risk against the vaccination. However, if the disease comes back into society, it's your kids who are going to be at risk. So I think it's, a, for me, but I'm biased because I work for immunization, I think it's not very fair to your child if you take his risk, because he's taking that risk, and you have a risk that you might be up halfway the night with a bit of painful or crying kid. So it's a balance. And what we see is the less there is a disease around, then immunization becomes less important. But then when we had in the 90s the uh, diphtheria outbreak in the Soviet Union, because they couldn't make vaccines, the, the whole system, Aeroflot, you know Aeroflot, the airline, was grounded, basically, after the, the, wall, the walls fell in Berlin. Uh, they had to ground nearly all the airplanes because there was not enough money to keep them going. So the flights were reduced. They would only go to a few places anymore. Consequently, all the vaccines came, of course, were produced near Moscow. 
So the vaccines were not delivered. They had to build cars, to uh, trucks to bring it there. It took three years, and consequently, they had a major diphtheria outbreak. And I think about 100,000 kids died eventually. I don't know exactly the number, but in that kind of range. And of course, at that time, everybody, when I went to, uh, Soviet, uh, to Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, all this country, uh, we would come, with, because it was a polio program, and everybody was saying, yeah, well, forget the polio, I want, my t I want my diphtheria. So if the disease is there again, everybody wants it. Look at the swine flu, or whatever name you give, Mexican flu, or you're not allowed to call it, it's the new flu, because you can't discriminate swines, and you can't discriminate Mexicans. So <laughs> it's the new flu. And this alternative flu is, uh, well, lucky enough, although I think in total at least 3,000 uh, people died, but was not considered by the society as a dangerous disease at the end. But if the mortality is like 20%, which was true uh, of the, uh, the disease that was in the 19, 1920s when they had the uh, Spanish flu, if 20% of your friends die within a three weeks, I can tell you, you're at the clinic saying, why am I not getting my shot? So it's perception. Very, uh, yeah. So, um, on the coverage rate was only the first dose. Both countries had a coverage of 95% for their campaign, and it was the campaign that brought it down. But the higher the first dose goes, the less often you have to do a campaign. If you have like 70% coverage, you can do the campaign <coughs> in four years or five years. Um, your last question is a, is a tricky one. Um, the, there is a major supply issue with uh, cholera. So at, there was a donation. This is what the, what the true story was, because I was involved. And that doesn't mean that it's true, but I was involved. And this is the true story. <laughs> um, not linked. Um, there was a donation of 100,000 doses. Now, for you, 100,000 sounds a lot, but we usually vaccinate 7 million kids. In China, we vaccinated in September uh, 113 million kids in two weeks. So 100,000 is not a lot. That's f you need two doses for cholera. So the donation, good meant, would only vaccinate a population of 50,000 people. Here we had a population at risk of 2 million, and you were going in there as UN saying, I have a vaccine, but we're only going to do this little camp. And we had, I think, 360 camps. We would be enough for one big camp, maybe two camps. So how do you decide which camp you go? And those kids would be protected, but there is a few months in between the first and the second shot. So the humanitarian world, not WHO, UNICEF, MSF, all the agencies said in our normal planning for, for uh, disaster management, we do not provide uh, vaccines because there is a supply issue. If we could buy 2 million doses, it would be fair. Normally, we can't even get 100,000. This was, by coincidence, one manufacturer who had obviously bought some vaccine and nobody was buying it and had that still in a good lifetime, so it was good vaccine, and in goodwill offered that. 
So there was a major confusion about messages coming to and fro. So yes, we are for immunization in general, but you have to have a supply. We have the same with yellow fever and meningitis. We have only about 15,000 doses per year. So we have a committee, and I'm in it, deciding which country will get how much if they have an outbreak. And they usually want 2 million, and we give them 100,000. And that's just to make sure to, to be fair to other countries. And if it was up to uh, a country like Nigeria, which is one out of five people in Africa lives in Nigeria, they'd buy all the stock up in one go. So we have to give also a chance to other kids. Not that they are bad, but I mean, and they are biggest, but they shouldn't be able to buy everything. So it's a, it's a bit on equity and a bit on, and I think the 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 uh, the example you gave is a very difficult one because there was a lot of noise as if there was all vaccine, but there was no vaccine. There was just a vaccine for a very limited, and to be quite frank, it's probably the minister who gets it and his friends. If, if there are any more questions, I would invite you to speak to Dr. Huska. I will call this uh, an end to this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.